Hey, welcome to our details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. I'm Katie. And we are three industrial designers living in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. That's right. <laughs> we have Katie Lim here today on the podcast, and she is a fellow SCAD grad as well as a mm-hmm. uh, toy aficionado. She's the current director of industrial design at Super Chewer at Bark. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, welcome. Yeah, mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, of course, we just want to, I guess, usually when we have other people on, we, we kind of want to just give a good history of who you are, what you what you do, mm-hmm. your background. Um, so, yeah, how, how did you get into industrial design? Like, what what is it about the field that you love? Gosh, um, I love industrial design because it's just a marriage of all these things. I was passionate growing up. Um, Growing up, you know, this is the time of trading spaces and all those, you know, reality shows for interior design. So I've always wanted to do that. And I would have books where I'd dive in and um, full of post-its of, you know, marrying this toilet to this bathroom and then with this living room. And then I was even drawing architecture plans and floor plans. And then if I couldn't find an image of a piece of furniture or anything I felt fit the space, I would design it Mm. without knowing that that was what industrial design was. I just draw it um i still have it and i love it but wait how old were you when you were doing this middle school okay early middle school um and then you know in high school you start to think about what you're going to do and what you're going to do with your life and interior design was starting to fade out i was like people have ikea i don't need to do that um and, <laughs> and then i was starting to get into architecture and was really passionate about that and sculpture we had an amazing sculpture program at my high school um, so I even considered the program at SCAD in Atlanta to be a sculpture major. Um, did you yeah. did you grow up in Atlanta? I grew up in Maryland, in okay. Annapolis. Um, and then even considered being an art teacher because I loved the idea of helping channel, like high, having high school students channel emotions or learning how to communicate through art and being a part of that. Um, so anyways, while I was doing the whole college thing, I was doing collegeboard.com and, and then industrial design pops up as this field that I had no idea about and I was like this is it it's sculpture it's interior design it's architecture it has like engineering aspects to it too and then from there on I just knew that's the field I wanted to be in um yeah that's awesome yeah yeah I mean that's the way I found about it out about it college board well not college board but oh. just like online yeah it, it's, it's you don't think not about it. a very romantic story right. and it's just like oh it just popped up on google <laughs> and it looks good yeah but uh no that's awesome um and then you went to scad i went to scad and and, and then how was your time there what was did you have any internships or i actually didn't and that was um you know i actually was very into faith and religion at the time um i was very involved with my home church and I was a, a youth leader for a summer, um, just mentoring girls and, and doing fellowship in that way. But I never had any design internships until I graduated um, and went to Kids too, which then it led into my, my first job in the field. Um, but SCAD at the time, the program I thought was like at a really great place with professors being super passionate about students getting into the field, um, the pr- program really kicking off there. Um, and then starting to do these sponsored classes and collaborative classes with companies. And that's how I started to fi- find out my passion for toy design and mm-hmm. how my personal aesthetic and my personal, like, and just my personality and character lent really well for toy design because it's a lot of fun, organic shapes. It involves character design, illustration work. Um, and I just really thrived in that class and it opened my eyes up to a lot of things so there, there was a sponsored class mm-hmm. for what company was it kids too okay so yeah kids yes. too and then you went to work for kids too then i went the to work for class. them yeah so i did that my junior year and then we'd been in touch i did the toy design class and then they, they had a baby gear class which is like bouncers high chairs things like that um and just really fell in love with it okay that's cool wait was this the class that went to china Yes. So that's, at the time, really so cool. first at the time you have to, I don't know how it was, how it is now, but you have to, you had to interview. It was very professional. You interview and then you're competing with your classmates to be sent on this sponsored trip for, for two weeks to do factory visits, visit studios there. Um, and it's just anyone who has the opportunity to go to factories or see processes is just should take it because you 
learned so much just by being in in a factory than you would in like a semester long class. Yeah, I remember hearing stories about that when I was at SCAD that there was like back in the day like they would take a entire like class to a factory in China, which was crazy, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't get it good at it. That's amazing. Wait, wait, so when you went to the factory, did they was it a tour or was it was there any collaboration with the factory? How did that work? Did this, you get to right. tool? Did the projects you, you worked on in the class get made? No. Okay. Sometimes they'll go through. With some classes, there there'd be like one or two students who got to teether out, and it was like everyone was like, "Oh my gosh!" <laughs> you, know, <laughs> right, right. Like, you know, it's like you got to thing out. But um, no. But we just it was more of a tour. Mm. Um, we went to like a sunglasses factory, and it's just funny because you see you go to this factory, they're making sunglasses you see on the street that are like a buck to like really high high end brands that cost five hundred dollars a pair and they're all coming from the same factory. Mm. But, you know, so it's branding and I'm sure, you know, materials and just attention to things in the process have to do with cost too, but yeah. it just it's funny to see it all come out of the same place. It's really ironic. Yeah, so the sunglass market is a lucrative market. <laughs> Luxotica. I mean, go watch documentaries on that. It's it's a interesting interesting Yeah. Thing. Did you get did you get any swag to take home? So you have yeah, you have fake, to be fake careful. Ray-Bans. No, yeah, <laughs> real, real Ray Bans that were just not, not that you just, they just took them off. Yeah, they, they're <laughs> really Chinatown. They they got it. Um, no, yeah, you have to be careful. You know, factory relationships. You know, they're you have to be careful with yeah, just different okay. relationships. So mm-hmm, that's fair. Um, yeah. So you went, you graduated, and then mm-hmm. you went to work for this company, Kids Two. Mm-hmm. What are some Tell tell us about that experience. How long were you there? Are you? I, I'm not really familiar with Kids Two or, or what kind of products they make, but hmm. Kids Toys, I assume. Yeah, Kids Toys. So they're known for brands for like Baby Einstein um, is probably the most recognized brand. Bright Starts, Obal, um, Taggies for a short time, I think. Um, and they focus on on infant toys, so like zero to twelve months. Um, some toddler toys, um, and then they also have brands like. Inf- uh, ingenuity, um, which is more like bouncers, and they all have their own aesthetic and branding. But so they house and own all these brands, and so my main focus during my time there was for Baby Einstein, um, a lot of Bright Starts, but a lot of toys for babies, um, and maybe even products like sound machines and play gyms. Mm. Um, Yeah, I think there's on your website, is there, if the internet is working, come on internet, (laughs) come on internet. My, Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, James. (laughs) We're, we're in a dungeon. Um, But uh, yeah, I think I saw a few toys. I think I saw a guitar. Yeah, that's for baby Einstein. Uh Uh-huh. What was like, what's a, what does a prompt look like that, that the guitar is then the result of that prompt? Um, So prompts can range from the things of, You know, when you're working for a large company, you're either given a price point you have to work around or you'll have people that tell you very specific things like we want a guitar that does this and does this, just make it look good and it needs three buttons. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a range. I don't exactly remember what the prompt was for this one. It might just be um, an instrument for kids. This was more of like uh, for zero to two years maybe Mm -hmm. um for baby einstein and i felt that that project really hit a location that you know you see toy guitars for more like older like three to five year toddler age groups or you see like rattle guitars for Mm. like baby babies so finding a sweet spot between that was um an opportunity i saw um so it's like basic but still has room for growth and development i'm kind of interested in and maybe the style of working at one of these companies, because mm-hmm. from from my, I guess, interpretation of what, what I've seen, it seems like it's very much, you do concept sketches, and then those sketches go to the factory? Is that correct? Or do you, have you actually, were you, did you actually do 3D modeling in CAD? I did ha- alias. Okay, yeah. so you were, you were CADing up these designs. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's all like surface design. So it's just mm-hmm. so you can communicate the aesthetic and the form, and then they'll probably rebuild the entire thing, right. um, send you things to review. But um, it goes from, you know, you send your concept, materials, uh, specs, 
and the CAD, and then they give you a quote for how much it will cost. And then you have to evaluate the cost with manufacturability, and then probably adjust the de- design from there after everyone's reviewing it and then okay. just working that way. That's interesting. Yeah, because I, I know, um, I feel like I've seen other toy designers just do like side views, like mm-hmm. illustrator side views. Mm-hmm. I think about like Nerf. I feel like the Nerf designers just do side views and then somehow there's some sort of magic machine that they just send it away and then it comes back <laughs> as a 3D model. So that's what, well, now at my current company, which we'll get into later probably, that's what I do. Okay. It, it just, there's no time to do the CAD work. So right. you'll, send, you'll send drawings and turnarounds and call outs and then they'll come back with, um, actually first they'll send renderings of their interpretation and make sure they understand the surfacing correctly from your drawings. And then um, from there they'll do a 3D model. So it works that way. Right, right. Okay. So, yeah. And <laughs> what what did your team look like at Kids 2? Was it like, were you a part of a, a large team? Like, you know, did you have, what was the hierarchy like there? Especially in terms of like the, the industrial or the mm-hmm. design team. Mm-hmm. So I started as an intern. So there's a layer of interns. Layer, layer sounds a weird. It's a weird word. So there's a there's interns and then junior. <laughs> <laughs> the bottom <laughs> the layer. The bottom foundation layer. of interns the foundation. upon which everybody walks. <laughs> yeah, interns are so the- important. Yeah. <laughs> um, which actually did real work. You know, you're not doing the coffee thing. You know, right? I was doing stuff that was getting produced. Um mm. So interns, junior designers, mid-level, senior, um, manager. And then there you could go one of two ways as far as career growth. I think you could go principal designer route or director route. How big was the design team at Kids? Um, there was different, see, industrial design side, 10. Okay. I think mm. it's, pretty, average, it's fairly yeah. large, I'd say. And, and this, <laughs> what you were just describing is a concept that I've only encountered recently is like this, this two track trajectory or, you know, this fork in the road right. for designers, like, you know, it, it like later, I, I guess, like, as they are more and more senior, mm-hmm. they can take these two tracks. Can you describe the difference between these two tracks? It's different for everywhere, but I'm assuming it's like the management side and the design, like the principal designer Mm -hmm. direction. Um, Management, I don't know, maybe it's a personal thing for me, has a negative connotation to it where Mm -hmm. it seems like you're very disconnected from design work and you're managing teams, which is an important skill to have for design and like knowing processes. And, but you're playing, you're, you're orchestrating a lot of different things going on in the company with strategies and um, just playing across different teams. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the role of a like, principal designer or maybe even design director, it is focusing on bigger design initiatives and getting to lead that. And you're still part of the design and then you have a team that helps execute it and helps add to that. And it's very collaborative. Cool. It's just my take on it. Yeah. 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 No, it's interesting. I, I think it was Ricky Biddle who, who told us about, um, I don't remember if it was at Newell Brands or Whirlpool, but just like this idea of, yeah, you can go the management route. Cause mm-hmm. like, there's always this thing of like, you know, should, should every industrial designer eventually become a manager? It, like it does, does no, everybody have think... that skill? And like, what if you just want to keep designing? Right. right. And so it's like, I don't want to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, and so it's, it's nice to know that there are these, these separate tracks. Right. Um, and honestly, you don't have to, I know there's, you don't have to move up. Right. You know, you can say no to a promotion. Um, right. But just knowing what that means as far as pay and responsibilities, but you can still, you know, stay in the role of drawing and designing if you want to stay there. That's interesting. I never yeah. thought about that. Yeah, I, I, I actually just thought about that too and someone said you, you can say no um <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> it's like what? what yeah but you know it comes down to different personal like life balance or yeah that is, you know, that's or... so interesting because now that i think about that and, <laughs> and i feel like this might yeah. get into our topic a little bit later right, on yeah. but yeah it's like you know you could earn another fifteen thousand dollars a year if you took on that you know senior like managerial managerial position but mm-hmm. but what what is that fifteen dollars if you don't get to do what you love or fifteen thousand if you don't get to do <laughs> yeah, fifteen fifteen dollars you know <laughs> if, if you don't get to do what you love okay but before we before we get into that because we do want to talk about that that's yeah. kind of what mm-hmm. what you're here for Katie and we talked about it earlier uh, 
when we met up the other week. But um, I want to finish off or get finish off your story here. <laughs> you you were at Kids, and then you went to I believe Pollen Design. Yeah, um, I just moved up to New York, and oh, so this is the big move. This, this was, is the big move. This is yeah. from Georgia. Wait, so how long were you at Kids 2? I was at Kids 2 for four years. Okay. Um, and my experience there was great. I just was feeling time for a change, need more, just something that they couldn't offer for new perspectives. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Atlanta was slowing down for me, but, you know, I love Atlanta. It's a great city. But um, there's just so much opportunity in New York and the excitement and the community you're in mm-hmm. just drew me to it. So. Um, I moved without a job and, and I went to, uh, Paul and design, um, with some other, there's two other sky designers there. And, uh, Andrew, I'm not going to try to name them cause I'm get their name wrong, <laughs> but, um, it was great. And so I was there for a year. Uh, were they, are they a consultancy or what do they do? I'm not familiar with Paul and design. Yeah. They're, so I learned they're a consultancy, but they also own a brand called Repara, which is, um, like kitchen tools and appliances. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Did you, did you, were there any interesting things you learned at Pollen or what you, what did you like about it? Um, I learned, I learned a lot of packaging while I was there, like structural packaging. Um, cause you know, I did a lot of pr- work for the prepare a brand. Um, so I got a taste of that, but also a taste of like what it's like to, to work on projects that are more consultancy based, um, and how meetings go and, and how you have to, work with clients um <laughs> which you guys probably have more experience that of, with that than i do because I'm, right. I'm very more like larger co- company focused but um yeah i guess for me that was my main my main experience out of that was just learning about packaging and how to, to design for packaging even um mm. and how to you know and what you communicate in packaging and how much does a product rely on packaging or shouldn't um was probably the biggest takeaway from my experience there that's yeah that's a good takeaway i mean i'm yeah don't know how to do packaging at all. Yeah, I don't think I've ever <laughs> designed any packaging. I, I think it's I've hard, designed yeah. some packaging, but it was horrible. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like I, you know. Was there was there any, like, big surprise ab- about, like, designing packaging versus designing, just, like, doing uh, typical industrial design work or, like, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> did you like it? Did you like packaging or you like traditional industrial design? I like traditional industrial design. Okay. I mean, you can approach packaging the same way, like problem solving with costing and how is it going to be made. But I don't think I learned enough to really be able to speak to it well. Mm, I mean, I, I one of the designers there I learned a lot from and he actually set a lot of the base and groundwork for for designs that I did. So he did the hard part and then I was able to tweak his his structure to to make it look good or Mm. play around with it cool okay i see so after pollen then you got the the job with all the dogs yes all the dogs (laughs) (laughs) you went to work for bark yes so in fact the toy design uh Uh, yeah tell us about that so bark box for those who aren't familiar is Mm -hmm. a subscription toy service and they also have you know uh, a shop online and all kinds of other Product avenues and things located in New York City. Um, Both James and I have done a project or two for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of how we've all connected together. Yeah. Yeah. I was, it's funny because I was actually, I was at Bark when they interviewed Katie. Really? Because they were like, because like Dan was like, yeah, I just met with this girl. Like, you know, and so we were all like checking out her portfolio. You know, like, you know what industrial designers do. I know. They were like, send me that link. Send me that link. <laughs> That's funny. James. So, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, um, no, but you know, obviously Katie got the job. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's funny. I went back into toy design. I actually saw a posting for, for the position a few months, but I was very reluctant to get back into it at first. Cause I wanted to still, I didn't want to pigeonhole myself cause mm. I still wanted to make sure I was giving myself the experiences to really make a decision on what I wanted to focus on. Um, but then when I met with um, with Dan Grossman there, uh, just learning about toy design at Bark and how they were just then bringing a building a design team in house to really build the brand and explore what is toy design at Bark, um, you know, and what's our branding through our toys and products, um, 
was something it was just something I really wanted to be a part of and the team was very passionate everyone there's very passionate so um so I accepted <laughs> wait when when was this how how long ago was this two years ago two years ago okay. yeah two years in like two months god it feels like it was yesterday <laughs> <laughs> um that's awesome so I guess I kind of want to hear like what is the difference between babies and dogs <laughs> it's funny because when I designed for babies, I pulled a lot of inspiration from dog toys because they're all, they're all chewing on something and teething on something, so they have like great textures. Are you saying that babies are basically dogs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but babies grow up, and dogs don't grow up. Yes, they're they just, do. They're just always little babies. Well, <laughs> like like dogs grow up to be like three year olds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 You know, like they're always going to be they like, go from like I mean, two year olds to three year olds. There can be some wise dogs. That's like true. Some, I, I've never had a wise. Actually, my, <laughs> I would say my first dog was pretty wise. My first, I had a, a golden retriever <laughs> named what? <laughs> Tagon. Tagon? Yeah, Tagen. because she was always tagging along. Oh, <laughs> yeah. interesting. What kind of advice did Tagon give you? Uh, I, you know, Tagon was just very wise and stoic of a dog. <laughs> You know, Stop. very had the the long. It was a red, more of a red coat, like mm-hmm. a red coat, golden. Mm. Very beautiful dog. Mm-hmm. I love tagging, but yeah, uh, you know, just I think by a, by attitude and action, that's the advice of tagging. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as far as you know, children children's toys, you have to go through so many safety testing and safety mm-hmm. gauges when designing. Whereas dogs. That's not really established. I mean, you have so many breeds and sizes. You can only go so far with safety testing. And we definitely do what we can to to make them as safe as possible. And like trying to continuously learn how to do that. Yeah, sa- that's safety. That's a big difference. I, yeah. I remember learning about a lot of this, the safety stuff with, with dog products and things like that. And it's... It's 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 can be scary. I mean, yeah. I sh- I'm sure that even in the, the baby toy industry, it's like you hear their horror stories mm. of products failing and oh, yeah. dogs choking or kids yeah. not. You know, it's, it's it's serious. It yeah. can be a serious thing. I, I think the, our standard, when I was at Petmate, we'd had, we we just put everything through the same standards that baby toys did. There's like mm. this little, did you know the little like, container you put stuff? Right, choke the little the choke choke yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, we had them, we actually had them at Lifetime Brands because mm. we would test mm-hmm. out like just like dropping product to see if like anything would break off. That's oh, like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Swallow. Mm-hmm. There's so many like uh, jaw entrapment, head entrapment. Um, there's just, mm. we would have hour long meetings of just going through a, a design and our, our product integrity team would just be like, well, this can kill them and this can kill them and oh, this. Yeah. And <laughs> it's just horrible to imagine, but you have to do it. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I made a cat toy that cats heads got stuck in but wait their it, hands or their heads their heads their heads their heads but it's okay but that was the plan no oh, wow. that's what, the game it wasn't the plan it wasn't the you know i i mean it's I, was I'm tagging sorry. killed by no, a cat no not no <laughs> okay no, no, no. all right oh you're saying because i would make a cat yeah. Yeah. yeah no yeah. no cats died i just there was like a few instances where the cat's head got stuck and they just had to kind of pry it out but it's okay <laughs> the cats are fine the cats are fine um, but no, I, uh, I mean, I did a few projects at Bark and it's a cool place to work. Mm. Um, d- tell us about some of your cool projects that you've worked on. Um, I think, I think a really fun one was this, it was the modular treat toy, which is probably, um, yeah, I share it on my Instagram, but that pro- that toy was cool because I got to design the treat with the toy. So what's a treat shape or treat design that could lend to a really cool play function or mm. just system of a toy for dogs? Um, so just being able to have access and the um, opportunity to do that was really fun. And this was a this was recently released. Is this correct? Yeah, it came out in January. Okay, so and and from what I can recall, it's like a sphere. Mm-hmm. It has two halves, and the halves unscrew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and they're kind of textured. Like the top half is like kind of this like diamond pyramid pattern, mm-hmm. and then you put this kind of donut flat treat. In it's like side. a. It is like three. It's, it's like kind it's of got, like a it's got like prongs on it. Let me see yeah, if I can. Three. All right, we have there internet. It is. Woo! Um, um, and then uh, it's it's on the over Instagram. here, right? I think yeah. It's here we go. Update portfolio. Oops. Oh no. no. <laughs> James is having some technical difficulties. It's okay. Uh, but 
But it, it is really cool because you can uns- – it's like a ball. You unscrew it and you can add the treat in right. between the sandwich. So the threading is actually – it's not – the threading is pronged, I guess you could say, because you don't need the threading to be continuous. It just needs to have points oh, for see. it to continue okay. to screw on. So that's what let us plug in the treat and have it be exposed while you can still secure the half to it, okay. the other half to it. Very cool. Very um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it just – we're still working on more designs that can work off of that treat shape um, and seeing what more we can do with it. I'm a big fan of the the rope toys that you did, the Tugamoles. Yes. Which yeah. is amazing. It's an entire collection of, I guess, what, safari animals? Like elephants, monkeys. I guess they're all safari. No, there, there's a beaver. I guess there's that's a, not safari. Yeah, there's a beaver. There's a bunny. There's, a, there's just a ton of animals. Can I ask, yeah. did, the, did it start with a pun? Did it start no, with the pun, uh, or did the pun come pun later? Holes. It came later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really fun. I th- I love your style, Katie. It's like very whimsical, but also minimal at the same mm. time. Yeah. I, like I, my face lights up every time someone brings that up because that was the first project in in my career that I felt like I got to be a hundred percent myself, mm. and I got full reign to do that, and like nothing changed in final production to it just worked so well um and that it started off as just more of a, a side project that was developed with no no end goal in mind just we believed in it and so it was just something i was working on kind of off off hours um but just really getting to own it like my only criteria was it needs to be it needs to have rope and it needs to have plush and you know we want we want it in your style mm. um and it was just really cool to explore that. Oh, so it was it it was a side project. So it was kind of like the the off hours project or like the Friday afternoon project kind of thing. Yeah, it it started off as something, but then the line got pushed to the side. But mm. um, but we continued to work on it and develop it and sample it to just keep bringing it back. And then when people saw samples, then it got brought uh, brought back up to the front. Yeah, see, when yeah. people see the actual thing, they're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So sometimes you just <laughs> Sorry, gotta do it. Actually. If you believe in it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's just, you just gotta put the extra work into it to just, I guess, I guess they needed to see the bigger picture. So they maybe saw a few concepts, but then when we just continued to develop a fuller line and a fuller collection, and then that's when they're like, okay, this is a bigger story. Mm. I, I kind of find this is a common thing, actually. I I see sometimes like, some of my ideas, you know, you can sketch them out and they're like interesting or whatever, but they're not really, f- they, they don't really grab attention unless they're like almost finished or like right. a prototype mm-hmm. or a test. And then people are like hopping on board like, whoa, yeah. I, yeah. I want a piece of this. Yeah. Have you ever had that experience? Yeah. I, I mean, I remember, I remember working at Lifetime Brands and at one point just like saying to my manager, like, why do we even show anybody outside of the design team sketches because they like uh, it's it's difficult because there's nothing like there's they get caught up on the wrong details yeah so Mm -hmm. often and i and i felt like we just need to make models or do renderings and like that's all we show anybody outside of our right outside of our unit outside of the design team because yeah I mean, otherwise you have to be the, strategic yeah, yeah the conversation would just like go nowhere right like was so. taken too literally and yeah yeah, yeah I, I've, i kind of struggle with this too it it, it also depends on the client too because right. I've, mm-hmm. I've had scenarios where it's like you show sketches to clients and they just don't see the vision right and so it's at some point at sometimes i just do straight renders like yeah hey i already did the sketches you don't get to see those mm-hmm. i pulled the best sketches from that group and hear the renders mm-hmm. a- and sometimes that goes over much better than sketches would yeah it, it's very like situational though. yeah but the other cool part about that story to me is that like that design was not a design that was like you know a design by committee type thing it was mm-hmm. sort of like your your vision your style like uh, you know, I, I have to imagine that it was based on just like, like where it was taking you. Like you, you were motivated by like uh, I don't know. I I'm not articulating this well, but <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't take credit for the actual concept of the the rope and the plush, and so that was my. I mean, that was the framework I had to design around. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, 
when you get to do your own thing, just like you're so motivated and passionate about it. It's just, it was so much fun to work on and explore. Yeah. I feel like companies should do that more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't know what can come out of it. And then, yeah, it's just a win-win. Yeah. That's awesome. So I I also, you've recently been promoted to the director of Mm -hmm. industrial design for the Super True brand, which is that the hard rubber ball that we just talked about with the tree toy in it. But there's Mm -hmm. also another bunch of other super chewing products that, you know, are are marketed to be super strong and durable Mm -hmm. for dogs that love to chew. Mm -hmm. How does it? How does it feel? Because it's a recent thing, correct? Or yeah, uh, a few weeks. You've been the d- director for a few weeks. That's me, awesome. Me a month. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't know how much how much you can speak to that then, but I I, uh, I know I think that's pretty pretty admirable. Yeah. It's awesome. Oh, Congrats. thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. No, the transition has been great. You know, I definitely have a learning curve and a lot to jump into, but. You know, having been so passionate and focused on the toys for the brand, which um, is, you know, it is just now starting to build up. It's trying, it's letting me more involved with the branding aspects around um, the toys and what we stand for and the integrity of Super Chewer and, and trying to define that and um, just getting to be involved with all the working elements around the toys is really cool. That's great. I um, I think we should start to transition into the topic mm. this week. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, Katie, you and I were talking about this the other week. We were at a the SCAD 40-year 40, 40 anniversary party. <laughs> um, and you brought this up about, there's this article, I believe it's on the Atlantic. Um, it was about work. Uh, you'll have to remind me the... the workism. Workism. Yeah. Essentially how, I guess, America has... Uh, elevated work to the degree of religion and you know we are all workaholics <laughs> nowadays uh. and uh and it's causing a lot of burnout and depression and a lot of bad things um and i just thought that it would be a great topic to topic talk about and so we wanted to have you on and talk about it yeah um but we'll link to the article definitely give it a read but for those who who are just listening right now what's kind of what's the rundown of this this idea yeah, um, I think so. BuzzFeed had put out an article about burnout, which led to articles from, or not, I don't know, what led to, but New York Times and The Atlantic also put out ar- articles about burnout and just how I think, even spe- more specifically, our generation, the, the millennials, are having such a different work culture po- approach to their career that um, is, is changing just the our attitude towards it where it is becoming like religion or like an identity um and just you know just people just people showing it i I'm sorry i'm still trying to think through it myself because it's mm. just such a you know I'm, i've been doing a lot of self-reflecting for you know design is something we're so passionate about and you know it's like that line between work and life and but also like what's the you know, you can still experience burnout, but you're doing something you're passionate about. And then if you don't have work, it's like this weird balance. It's always coming back to balance. But um, yeah. And the other thing, like the the like cherry on top of all of that is like, you know, you're supposed to be you're supposed to be happy about all this. <laughs> like you're supposed to be like the at least the way that it's depicted is like like this is this is the life that I want. Like mm-hmm. do what do what you love, and oh. you're ha- you'll be the happiest right. person ever. That is, yeah. You, I think the audience knows that that's, that's my like <laughs> least favorite phrase. Well, yes. it talks about that. It talks about the expectations now. It's like if you experience any sort of disappointment or or something that feels like a job in your workplace, then you know you're like I'm out, or it's like I'm not in the right place, which mm. it does set set you up for disappointment in right. certain ways. Yeah, the the one thing that I thought was interesting is like they were talking about how, and specifically with the millennial generation, how we were raised on this idea of find your passion, like right. find what you like to do and make that your career because because then again you wouldn't work a day in your life. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and there's two sides of that story, right? There are the people that have found their passion mm-hmm. and then love their work, not all the time. Right, I understand that. I think. I think maybe the the part that you get caught up with, James, is that like a lot of times design is very hard and we struggle with it and there's days that we hate, but I think holistically we enjoy the career, mm-hmm. the profession. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, we love the profession, or I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then the flip side of that coin is for all those people that have been taught this thing of like find your passion but haven't quite found it yet mm -hmm. and they just keep working harder and mm -hmm. harder trying to find this thing yeah that may or may not ever come right where do, where does this whole idea of like find your passion like do your passion where does that mm -hmm. come from like That's does that question. does that come from like the our parents who didn't necessarily right. do the thing that they wanted to do and did they right. impart that on us or I that might be true I think what I was reading is mm. um, you know bef the generations before us they had a job mm -hmm. and then the entire idea behind the job was that hey you go you give your time to mm -hmm. make money so that you can spend that money to have time right and they have this life outside of it right it's that transaction so that you can spend time with relationships you can spend time in your hobbies you can spend time doing the things that you loved Mm -hmm. in, you know, in that generation. Um, and, you know, maybe it kind of stems out of that of like, hey, what if I didn't have to work at this job? Mm -hmm. uh, what if I could just spend time on my hobbies all the time? Mm -hmm. And I feel like maybe that was kind of passed down to our generation of like, hey, there's this cool mm -hmm. thing, you know, you got the internet now, you <laughs> have the opportunity to just spend time on your hobbies full time. Yeah. Right. And maybe that's where it got mixed up. I don't know. Right. But then also their their generation, you know, you, you work at a company and you're there for 30 years. Right. And, they, you know, we're not going to retire with pensions or, you know, <laughs> like, you, know you, you have like, you're somewhere three hours, three, three hours, three years. And then you move. Like, that's just when I told my dad I was leaving kids too or leaving pollen after years. And it's like, yeah. he's like, what? You're leaving? Or, you right. know. He's he's very focused on me finding somewhere to just be long term. I feel um, like nowadays, if you're anywhere more than like three years, like you're like a veteran. <laughs> right? Or does that look bad? Like it's or you know, especially as creatives, is that bad to be somewhere that long for just like to stay fresh or do something different? I don't um, know. That's a good question. I mean, yeah. it, from my from my viewpoint, like if I saw someone that had been at a job for two years or maybe even a year. Mm -hmm. I would be okay with that. I think when you get down into the six months or like the three months, then it's a little questionable. Mm. Um, you know, the year is definitely a, hey, you know, what'd you do? Like, what was the the impetus to move? But um, I don't know. I think past a year is fine. I, I don't know. What do you think, James? I don't know. I, I, I definitely felt like, at least with my first job, I mean, I also had this drive that I wanted to, wanted to leave my first job. You know, and and so after it just so happened that like after three years, there was like a catalyst that that like allowed me to leave Did, and to start freelancing. And I don't know if you want to answer this or not, but was it you wanted to leave pretty soon after you started there? Or was it like, hey, I've been here for a year. I've been here for two years. It's time for me to move. I, I definitely had some highs and lows. Okay. Um, so like after, like after a year, I was like, I want out after a year and a half, I was like, I have, I have found the perfect situation for mm -hmm. myself. And then after like two and a half years, I was like, I want out again because that situation <laughs> changed. Interesting. So like, yeah, I mean, I, I think that like, I don't know, I, I like have met veterans of companies and it's like. You know, there were veterans of that company there that had worked there for like seven to ten years. And it's like, yeah, there's like always going to be those highs and lows. And mm. I don't know. I, I'm curious, Katie, like what about this article like specifically spoke to you like when you read it and, and got your curiosity and... Um... Um, for me, just the analogy of work being a religion really stuck mm. out to me. Um, I'm part of this group in New York called Women in Innovation, mm -hmm. uh, WIN for short, and they've expanded to London and San Francisco. But whenever I go to events there or a mentor I have through there, it feels like a support group or like a you know, Bible study almost. And mm. you know, just everyone's passionate um, or believes in a certain aspect of like their their per like it goes down to what's your purpose in life and what's your impact, um, mm. you know, and it can get really existential quickly but um just you know what what do i want to focus my time and life and talents on um right which is something i was really just just comparing it to a religion was just something i never like 
put together before. Mm. And, and you said that you were involved in sort of like your religious community mm-hmm. growing up. So like, like are, are you as involved now or like do you find that yeah. you have adopted work as your new religion? Yeah, it, it's gone that way. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not as religious as I was growing up. Um, yeah. But, you know, it is a similar practice, I guess. You know, it's like it, it's your passion. It's, it's something I, you know, design and, and design principles and, you know, Dieter Rams or, or Rams, however you guys want to say it. It's just like really <laughs> influential of just, you know, what you want to do with design. And it's it's hard, like, you know, he regrets being a design an industrial designer you know he wants to be an urban planner i mean then i know this is a whole nother podcast but <laughs> you know <laughs> so it's how do we battle that like what how are we contributing while you know making these products that add to like con- consumption and materialism and mm-hmm. you know how do we address that yeah I, yeah i feel like this is the hard problem specifically with industrial design in related to, related to this conversation is that like industrial design feels like this this religious thing of like, hey, this is the save the world thing. Mm -hmm. Industrial design is the save the world thing. (laughs) As compared to maybe, you know, this article talks more broadly about other careers and, you know, it could be like people that just like to work in marketing or blah, 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 blah. But it's like for us as industrial designers, we, we do see this as a like a savior thing. Yeah. And like a responsibility. Yeah. Like uh, this is like a responsibility to, to the world to create amazing products that that help save the world and yet there is this the you know it, it pushes us it drives us to the breaking point and i i don't know i mean i definitely <laughs> think about design and do design 24 7 i don't turn it off mm-hmm. i can't turn it off <laughs> and i feel like it's it might be catching up to me eventually i yeah. don't know i i and i've had I, like we had Derek Cassio on the podcast who kind of addressed the whole save the world thing. And, mm. and I've had a lot of conversations with him off the podcast and, you know, like one of the things and, and like this idea of like, what is a job anymore? And, and how much like, I think, I think it's unfortunate that as industrial designers, we take on this like Goliath responsibility considering that it, if it were up to us, we wouldn't necessarily be polluting the world. Like that's mm. not, that's not our, I don't think that's anybody's end goal. Mm. And it's like some people, some people are just going to be doing a job because like they have to do that job to sustain themselves. But like there are different ways in which you can affect the world and affect the world around you. And maybe it's not through your job, but it's through your community. It's through mm. your family. It's like, like I, I, I think that we have, sometimes I feel like we have this inflated sense of, of worth in terms of like <laughs> what we're going to do to save the right. world. I, I, t- I totally agree with this too, James. Yeah. And, and so like, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's bad. I, I don't know. I feel very mixed about this feeling of like, like, should we be imparting this on the next generation of designers that like, you need to do something to save the world. Like you need to be doing, you know, like this is your responsibility as a designer. I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't even know where this save the world mm-hmm. thing came from because it's it's instilled on the younger generations and mm-hmm. every design student, you ask them what they want to do, they're going to say save the world. <laughs> and it frustrates me so much, but it's just like, it, I, I, I also want to echo your statement of like, industrial designers are important in that process but there's a lot of other gatekeepers that that have to that you have to go through to right. to make a save the world type of product mm-hmm. you know like I, I even think about the, our recent project we're working on right now james with the tech company it's like essentially we're just making the thing look nice like <laughs> <laughs> they're doing all the save the world stuff they're making all the the technology that goes into it they're making mm-hmm. all the software that goes into it we just get to make it look nice that so that people might want it. But at the end of the day, like whatever it looks like doesn't really matter because it's what's what's on the inside that's going to save what's the world. On the inside that counts. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, this, I mean, that's interesting. You know, I worked on a project, um, these dolls called Selma's dolls that, um, you know, wasn't my 
you know, these two women in Atlanta who are amazing started this business line or, or this collection of dolls that address diversity and ethnicity um, in toys. And I just designed them, but it was, so I was involved in that way. But like you guys are saying, you just, you're just making it pretty or like there is, you know, that's more of our role in some situations. Yeah, I, I definitely think we we do a lot of times are just tasked with the skin job. You know, right. like just putting a nice, uh, you know, facade over a product. But there also are other times where we do get to implement our, you know, save the world capabilities. Quote, air quotes for those who, who aren't listening <laughs> or, or for aren't watching. But um, it's like there are the times where it's like, oh, if I made this piece, you know, moldable in, in just one half, then it uses like half the amount of plastic. Right. Or if I made this piece be able to unscrew, then people could repair it. There mm-hmm. are those moments, and I think those moments are key. Um, but again, at the end of the day, like, uh, what about a surgeon, doctor? Like, who's saving <laughs> the world more? I don't know. But even you see all these people, like Yanko Designer, just all these thesis projects of amazing designs and solutions that they don't go further than that, or even mm-hmm. uh, like designing for disabilities. You know, there's all these great solutions, but it's it's getting past like how do you just get it out there and really implement it? And there's right. all these obstacles that um, are sometimes it's impossible to go through to to have it implemented. So there are a lot of solutions out there. It just you know, it doesn't go further. Yeah. yeah, that's where that's where like you know the Kickstarter is is kind of interesting mm, yeah. because like it's at least opened up this like. A, a richer understanding of like, you know, what design is like when when in a Kickstarter video they're describing the design. It's like you can get into it in a way that like traditionally you could only get into in sort of like a QVC type format or like an as seen on TV where you're like demonstrating. But it's like you're giving this like backstory okay. and it's like very like these like rich videos of storytelling. So like. I don't know, like, like maybe, maybe that's like the avenue for some of those types of design ideas. Because right. like the other thing with like designing for disability or anything like that, it's like the economics of like designing for like specific disabilities. Like, it can be extremely expensive to do just like a limited run of things, like where right. the market is yeah. small. And so, like, that's that's kind of almost a product of, like, the industry mm. and the methods, right? Yeah. So, I'm just, people take advantage of that so much, too, because I, I worked on a project for um, children who are blind and mm. think tools that are used to help them develop it and, oh, like, wow. develop curiosity. There's these things called the little rooms. <clears throat> Excuse me. These things called the little rooms that are made of plywood and, like, metal hinges and just made from, and pipes from just, Home Depot scraps basically and they're kind of like a a play gym where this kid is put in this box that has hanging toys and textures and around them and they're just it's things to make them curious that um sorry the ability to see like doesn't because they aren't able to see the to have the curiosity is not really um added to sorry I'm like not sure well I think I got it it. it's like it doesn't look pretty on the outside because the kid can't doesn't really well, need. And it's very economic to, in ser- terms of materials. Right. right. Well, what I'm getting to, no, people make these things and they sell it for like two thousand mm. dollars, and people buy them because they're they're not made in ways or, or accessible. Like they might not know how to make them or mm. or have the re- the materials, so people take advantage of the market. Oh, I see. Um, is what I was getting at. <laughs> but oh, I see. I, yeah, I mean that. I mean that kind of goes back to just you know, supply versus demand. Yeah. Right. There's, if there's very little demand, you just have to price it appropriately. It's just, right. just how the market works. That's where like, you know, going forward in the future, if we can get like the sort of like rapid manufacturing sort of things up to speed, mm-hmm. like where you don't need to cut a mold to like, to make something and you like, you don't need to do all these things in order to get a, a product. Right. Like, that changes the entire game. Yeah, like like if kids too wanted to do one of these, you know, blind kind of play gyms for kids, mm-hmm. you know, the, if, at a, a rapid uh, prototyping facility, you could just like make, you know, three or four of them. And if it was super cheap, 
Right. Then it'd be affordable for you those could, three yeah. or four people. I think that it's still it. something that could be done. It's just, uh, yeah, when the market's so small, it's hard to get people on board. But maybe now, and that was a pro- that was like my senior project. Maybe maybe now like Kickstarter and things out there right now could yeah. help get it somewhere like that. Yeah, because you can now like really much more efficiently amplify that message. Like it's crazy to me, like right. that when I was in college, I don't know, I don't know if Kickstarter was a thing yet. I can't remember. And like Instagram was definitely wasn't a thing. And so like, like it's crazy to me, like how many tools have come out like in the last couple of years that are just like game changers in terms of like an individual being able to amplify a message to like a bigger audience. Mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you that's, know? that's, yeah, it's going to be amazing. Can I, can I address mm-hmm. another, another issue that kind of goes off of the workism, like yes. something that really bugs me. I really like I I strongly dislike the like the startup vibe office mm-hmm. like the the like your home away from home right, live at office. Work. Oh, yeah. you mean like oh we got nap pods? We have <laughs> right. all we have all the snacks and yeah. food you could ever want. All the beer and wine. Your meanwhile, gym. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, if you sleep in the nap pod, it like. <laughs> The, the pod like turns over and like lets you out on the street because you're fired. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I, I really, I really dislike cause, cause I do feel like what people are asking from work now is to basically like be the center point of their entire community. Mm. And it's like, I don't want to live at work. I don't like, I have a home. I want to, I would rather be there. Like, you know, there, there's just like mm-hmm. a lot of things where I feel like I'm people are trying to dupe me into thinking that like, yeah. this is the center of my world. Mm-hmm. Um, and and one of those things is like making it this homey vibe where there's all these snacks and, and events. Well, yeah. First of all, I, I do like drinking LaCroix yes. when it's free yes. <laughs> on the tap. Okay. I can do that. Yes. I also love the snacks. I, 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 I like this point too, James, because I think this is something that I've always been very strongly uh, had strong, strong feelings about um, when I was working full time. I remember I would, you know, there'd be people that would, you know, work extra hours and they're salaried. So they wouldn't get paid for those extra hours. They would just work extra hours because like, hey, got to like show the boss you're working hard. Hmm. And, you know, my interpretation was like, as a designer, and as, you know, an employee of this company, we made a pact when I signed up to work here. Like, I will work eight hours a day for this amount of money. Mm. And, you know, granted, like, hey, there's a few times out of the year where maybe I had to work extra an hour or two just to get a project out the door. Like, I understand that. But, you know, it's a it's an agreement. Hey, we made an agreement. And if you guys want to, I don't know, pressure me to feel like I'm not holding up that my end of the agreement mm. and I should work extra, like... That is, that I feel like that is wrong mm. uh, for companies to like put that pressure on their employees, mm. and so like I I've always felt like no matter what, and when I build a company, it's gonna be like, hey guys, like it's five o'clock. I know we didn't finish today, like we'll just have to do it in the morning, or we'll have to schedule out more time. We, you know, there are ways around not having to work later hours, mm. and I don't. Know, I I really hope that I can uphold that idea of like leaving at five and yeah. not having to feel like you have to work longer just because mm. yeah that's great i mean that's something i realized another reaction i had to that article i brought up was you know reading it not instead of feeling that oh i need to work less or have better balance i felt like i needed to work harder because if not someone else is just going to come right in and or like i'll just you know i'd be dispensable mm. or some, you know just like oh i'm not working hard enough because and everyone else is working harder than i am was a strong feeling i had and like the pressure I I, I, mm-hmm. I don't understand because you know I, I I've seen this and it's it's interesting to me because in my head it's like my designs don't get better if I work an hour longer mm-hmm. like it it as a designer I feel like I'm designing an object and you know time is not necessarily tied to how great that object is gonna be mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's it's more just like the mental input. I mean, sometimes you have to step away. You need to like go right. back to it fresh. Yeah. I will. I will provide a counterpoint, which Let's is it, I, I think <laughs> that there. I think that there have been like sort of surveys or studies done recently about like people who work longer hours, and it's actually that they like tend to earn four times more money than their counterpart 
it's like it's like sort of this crazy exponential like gain to to work to be like working longer mm. hours okay um here, <laughs> and another counterpoint okay. especially for those going for internships like mm. i i think especially when you're starting out at a job like i do believe in like the first in last out because i think that like if you can get more face-to-face -face time with somebody who's like like higher up than you like right. you know in that like after hours or like early hours scenario like that is a benefit to like start to create that relationship yeah that's happened to me a lot you know i find myself in that like you're late that's when you know that's when you'll get the only chance to talk to the founder right you know get to have a conversation i agree with your <laughs> statement <laughs> I, know I agree with your statement to some extent i think that uh there are some pros to, you know, being the early bird and like the one that is showing that you're working harder. It just, there, there are some situations where it's like people are just staying there longer just to see right. like they're working mm. harder. Right. And then I also will add in my scenario when I was like, Hey, you know, like it's five o'clock, like I'm not going to just work an extra half hour because like just to do just it. To do it. Yeah. The, the other couple of hours I spent when I got home, was on myself yeah. and building the Instagram thing and building my own brand and like building me as a person, not necessarily the company right. up. Like the, there was a, a point in this, the article, the workism article about talking about how like, you know, I, I think it was, it was the editor or something. It was, it was someone in particular. It wasn't like generalizing, but they were saying how like, yeah, I, I don't want to, Work, why am I working for a company and building up someone else's dream instead of my own dream? Mm. I think that was like, they were talking about how like, I don't know, people were, entrepreneurs were, had this mindset or something like that. I, I can't remember, but that that that's my point of like, hey, like I made this agreement with you guys to work this many hours and the rest of the time is for my hours to spend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you want to spend them in leisure, you could. And if you want to spend them in, you know, building up yourself, you can as well. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think I, I just like one of the things that the article, you know, talks about in terms of like work being a religion and people like looking for like meaningful work and looking for meaning in their work. Mm. I, I do feel like hard like the the whole like hard work thing and and working very hard on you know w whatever task you have at hand like especially I, I don't know like there are times where you are super busy and the work is like really demanding but at the end of it there is a feeling of accomplishment you know like i feel like one of the reasons that I got into industrial design was that very like tangible result. Mm, yeah, and yeah. like, I think that there, there can be a benefit to like those, those like long hours of working very hard on something because it does feel like an accomplishment. It feels it. And it feels like uh, meaningful in a way that like you feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. Like, do you, do you find that like, I mean, for for me personally, I I'm totally on that. Like, I agree, working hard and working long does you know result in amazing and fulfilling you know designs and experiences. But I am in a stage of my life where it's it, I've built that for myself. Mm -hmm. Like, when I work long hours, it's for myself. Right. It's for, on these projects that I'm really excited about. You know, it's for these clients that I'm working with and like it's it is going to benefit, you know, me mutually with another uh, another client. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's more of a corporation and maybe a company that you don't really enjoy working for, or you're just doing it, you know, as your as your job or as your salary. I, I feel like the working long hours thing, you may not get that tangible, exciting benefit from. I don't know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my thought on that. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I mean, it's hard because, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't do, I'm not, I have the freelance lifestyle right now and like working for a company, you know, it's just, it kind of, sometimes it goes hands in hand. It's your personal project for, I'm just trying to process how, you know, the long hours. 
You've worked on some freelance projects before, have you? I have, yeah. Do you feel like those were more rewarding? And, I mean, obviously those were um, outside of work, right? Mm. So, you know, you're working later hours. You were putting in extra time during the day. Did you feel like that was very rewarding as as compared to maybe some of the other products projects that you have worked on uh, during your day job? Yeah. I mean, those dolls I mentioned earlier were, were definitely like a lot of hours into it because it just felt it was very meaningful and right. something I wanted to be part of. That's interesting. See, and this, and this is kind of the part that str- I struggle with with this article and industrial design is because we love <laughs> industrial design. <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> like industrial design is our hobby. Right. I mean, yeah. it is a thing. So, uh, yeah. But like uh, also for me, I, I get a lot of anxiety and guilt when I try to relax or take a break. Mm-hmm. It's like I have free time. I need to be reading a book about design or I need to be working my portfolio or I need to be drawing. I need to add to my Instagram. I, there's a right. list of things that right. you can just go to. And it's so hard for me to just t- like give t- myself time to just like relax and reset. And yeah, I don't I, know how to do I it. I feel that way 100%. James, tell, tell yeah. us how. James is, going on, <laughs> James is going on vacation next week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But well, and you mentioned something there, which I think is is a big part of this conversation, which is the social media aspect to yeah. it, which is like, like, yeah, like even in your off time, you go on Instagram and somebody's posting work that com- and it, it compounds the entire this problem. Guy Nick Baker just always <laughs> posts stuff. <laughs> And oh, I mean, I don't know about you, but to me, it feels like it's a, it's almost like uh, that that quote for people who want to drink early in the day. It's like five o'clock somewhere. It's like somewhere <laughs> somebody is doing work and posting it. Right. And it's like so you get on Instagram like in your relaxing moment. It's so funny because like it's the moment to to get in the relaxation and you pull out your phone because you can finally take a breath. And then you're like, oh, God, Big somewhere, so, somewhere someone's working. <laughs> You know, or that, yeah, like they're like taking a picture of like a design book in their lap and they're like, mm, Sunday fun day, just going to like read, you know, yeah. it, like, I, I don't know, like, do, like, do you think that that, that adds, that must add to it, it right? It definitely compounds yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but James, give us, give us, do we have any tips for how to relax? I need to relax. Uh, delete your Instagram off your phone like I did. <laughs> It's a fair tip. It's Wait, fair tip. do you get the update? You know, iPhone tells you you spent this many hours. A oh week, yes. Or you went, <laughs> and how does it make you feel? Oh, disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, you, what you do you think? have your set at, Katie? My average time is maybe two hours a day. I guess adds up to like one to two. That's good. Yeah. But that's good. That's it always my, feels great when limit. it says it goes down. It's funny how much it actually you feel great about it. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know how much that was helpful to anyone, but I, I'm sure that everyone feels very, uh, very, very familiar with this issue, and yeah. hopefully, this will start a great conversation um, with everyone on the on the Discord and the YouTube, and you know, in the studio if you're listening. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you, Katie, for coming on and, yeah, and having a chat having with me. us. Yeah. Uh, you know, we'd love to have you back, chat some more. I think you have some <laughs> great insights on on the toy industry and things like that. Yeah. Um, and we also, yeah, we've talked about some other things that would be good to talk about as well. But, um, yeah, where can we like find about, find out your work and stuff? Uh, katielim.com is my site and then katielim.id is my Instagram handle. Okay. Did you have, do we have another, don't you have another Instagram handle or is that? I do. It's a limb doodle. Okay. Um, and that's for my, my doodles and illustration side. So a we different didn't even talk about your illustration side. Yeah. I mean, we, you, you talked a little bit about your, like, your your dolls and things, but did you, have you illustrated a book? Did I read that on your... On um, your uh... We, I, I helped illustrate a book for the dolls, but I'm getting into, I'm starting to do more children's book illustration, nothing published or just okay. self, um, self-taught self explorations, I guess. Um, but illustration just came out of result from toy design and doing character design, and I just started drawing more on the side, and I took maybe one class in college for illustration, but... It's just more of exploring. I definitely like the limb doodle. Okay. It's limb doodle. Is it limb doodle or limb doodles? Limb doodle. Limb doodle. Okay. Uh, so check that out, you guys, if, uh, on the Instagram and everything. We'll link to it on our website. Um, and then, and then, yeah. Uh, as always, subscribe, like, comment, rate, all the things. All the things. <laughs> um, Do them all. 
intro and outro is by Kyoshi the Kid. Mm-hmm. And as always, I'm as I'm at Nick B. Baker. And I'm at I'm drawing receipts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Katie. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>